good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us live right now. Welcome to our month-long Global Student Showcase, where we are celebrating students in classrooms and school communities around the world who use technology for good. I'm Mary Alice Curran. I happen to be located right now in Connecticut in the United States, and I'm so proud to be alongside my colleague in Mexico. Hola, buenos días. Hello to everyone. Soy Eugenia Tamés. Estoy desde Monterrey, México, transmitiendo el día de hoy en, este, en esta nueva sesión de nuestro Global Student Showcase. Y estoy súper feliz de que durante todo este mes hemos estado celebrando alumnos, maestros, expertos que han compartido con nosotros a lo largo de las sesiones realmente historias conmovedoras que promueven el uso positivo de la tecnología. Y para mí es un gran honor el día de hoy que no sea una excepción, porque el día de hoy también vamos a estar junto a Jennifer Williams y sus alumnos de Total Action Climate. Y va a ser una sesión súper especial. So, entonces, no es, de, no es acerca de mí, es acerca de todos, es acerca de los que van a compartir con nosotros. Thank you for having us today here. So, it's not about me, it's about everyone who is going to join us during this session. So, welcome everyone. Welcome and thank you. And thank you, Frank, for starting us off in our comments, because if you're joining us live, please let us know where you're joining in from, because with no further ado, we can't wait to introduce um, Dr. Jennifer Williams and the Take Action um, youth panel who are incredible and who are global. Um, and so Gwenny and I, we will be behind the scenes working the comment section and let's pull up our guests for today. Yes. Here we go. Do we have everybody up? Ta-da. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Hi, well, team. <laughs> I have to say, um, Dr. Williams, this is not the first time that we've had the opportunity to celebrate the work that you're doing. Um, you've been involved in so many of our different events, but to be able to celebrate you today during this month-long event is really extra special um, because each one of your, um, the youth that are joining us right now, their words and their actions are making such a significant difference. And so for anybody that is joining us, please use their hashtag climateactionedu, and we're gonna let you take it away. We'll be behind the scenes cheering you on. Oh, thank you, Mary Alice. Thank you for your whole team for this month of student voice and taking action using ed tech for social good. I know a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And we have been able to participate in the DigSit activities over the past several years. And thank you for inviting us. And I have an incredible team of young people who are out taking action every single day in our world. So in just a moment, I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. But I know with the month-long celebration, we have so many great stories coming from the classroom. I heard yesterday there was a presentation about CPR and a community action campaign. And so we have been on our team working with K-12 students from over 150 countries around climate education. So supporting teachers and students on taking action for the planet which is a really important topic right now as we gear up for Earth Day next week. And so K-12 students and teachers is who we're working with, but today our panel is with university students joining from around the world. And Mary Alice and I were talking about the power of language and the importance of native language. So I'm going to share over and turn the mic to Carla, but we had an idea for you all to introduce yourselves in your native language and then in English and maybe teach me and our audience uh, how to say hello in your native language. So Carla is on our team and she's leading a lot of efforts in Europe and beyond. She's been with us for several years now. She has an incredible story that we will be diving into a little bit later. But Carla, I'd love to turn the mic over to you so you can introduce yourself to this global community. Um, Grüezi, guten Tag, that is German for those who don't know. Uh, 
Swiss German and German as they are both slightly different. My name is Carla, as Jen mentioned. I am currently located um, in the northern part of the Netherlands. I am very interested in healthcare, but also have a deep passion for climate change and taking action. Um, and my role at TAG really is kind of wherever help is needed, currently working on um, developing and getting our climate action project started in my home country, Switzerland. Thank you, Carla. And now we'll zoom across the planet and we'll go to Canada to meet Ria. So hi, Ria, good to see you. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ria. Uh, namaste. Um, my native language is actually um, Hindi. Um, I also know Urdu, Punjabi, and just a little bit of sign language as well. Um, I grew up speaking these languages uh, with my family, learning alongside family members and friends. And I am a university student at the University of Toronto. I'm majoring in political science. And I'm really excited to be here today and share a little bit about why it's so important to include youth voices at the forefront of companies and corporations and organizations um, taking action for the future. Thank you, Ria. I know Mary Alice is probably beaming with you mentioning American Sign Language because that is um, a community that she holds very dear and uh, is supportive of as well. So thank you, Ria. Welcome. Now let's jump over to Rwanda and our uh, colleague, Ayanfa. Nice to see you, Ayanfa. Uh, so that's um, hello in Yoruba. Yoruba is a language and a tribe from southwestern Nigeria, where I'm from. And um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm currently studying entrepreneurial leadership um, in my second year at the African Leadership University here in Rwanda. And a tag, um, just like Carla, I'm usually available for whatever work is on the table. Um, recently, I've been working on videos that, on, on climate education videos used by educators and students around the world. And I'm once again, really excited to be here. Wonderful to have you. So now we'll go to China with our intern Yiting. Hi Yiting, good evening to you. Hello everyone, my name is Li Yiting and I'm from Beijing, China. My native uh, language is Chinese and I will introduce myself in Chinese. 嗯,大家好,我的名字是李一婷,我来自中国北京. Um, and uh, my major in college is finance, and I'm also interested in international relations. So I plan to join an international organization like uh, the U United Nations and take action global as well as combine economy and international relations and make efforts to help more people all around the world. I'm now an intern in Take Action Global and major responsible for content creation and translation between English and Chinese. As I want to raise awareness of climate action in China and make the world less polluted together with youth from China. Thank you. Welcome, Yi Ting. And then finally, Maria, who's been on our team. And if you follow our social media at Take Action EDU, Maria leads all of our social media efforts. She, she covers Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and in, in her spare time, she is also a full-time student and travels the world. So Maria, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Maria José y soy de Perú. Hi everyone, my name is Maria and I'm from Peru. Um, but I study business management and economics at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And right now I'm in Peru visiting my family, so it's really nice to travel around the world to be able to do that. Um, I'm also a community strategist and fellow for Take Action Global. So as Jen mentioned, I make sure that social media is updated and that we're connecting with all the students and teachers around the world and letting them know about our events, webinars, and projects that we have going on, um, which are always really exciting with TAG. Thanks, Maria, and thanks, everyone. Welcome to the session today. 
So as you can hear, we have incredible young people who are out every day taking action for the planet. But you may also pick up on that they are looking at climate education across multiple disciplines and industries. So taking action for the planet in healthcare, in design, in computer science, in marketing, all these different areas. So we at our organization, Take Action Global, are on a mission of climate education for all. And every day we are using technology to connect to classrooms and to each other. So we are in a room here today for our, our session, but this is how we work every day. So we have never met in person, though we work on teams that are creating every week of the year. And some of those tools are helping us to document stories from classrooms. Some of them are helping with research. And as Ayanfa said, we're creating content. So we're creating videos and other resources that teachers can use to bring climate education to their classrooms. So we see climate education in the arts classroom, in the PE classroom, in the language classroom. And so today we wanted to get the perspective of our young change makers in their journey as students. So first starting with their K-12 education, which as we can imagine, they have come from all around the world. Schools look different, even in my own community. I'm in Florida, so I can go from one school to the next and that looks different. But we'd love to hear about your journey and some recommendations that you may have for our community of teachers and students who are listening today. So I'm gonna kick it off with Carla. And she, as I mentioned, has been a part of climate action work with us for the past several years. And she has a really interesting story and her work that she's heading into. But Carla, you and our other youth leaders joining today have shared about your K-12 school programs and how they really supported your interest and your voice as a student. So I'd love to have you kick off our conversation with sharing a little bit about the program you came from before university in K-12. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, so um, I, well, I think thinking back, my education, my educational journey really started in the Montessori school system in the U.S. Um, because I was born in Switzerland, but then grew up in the U.S. for the majority of my childhood, actually. Um, now, for those who are not familiar with the Montessori system, it features and supports a lot of hands-on learning um, and a lot of collaboration work which I think also then led to uh, global issues being introduced to me early on in very creative and perhaps what we now think are very simplified ways. But I think they're the ways that we also get the pure opinions and ideas out of children, um, which can make such a difference to developing those solutions and projects and really that sense of innovation that will bring us forwards and finding uh, lead us to find solutions to global complex problems like climate change. Um, I do have to say, though, I have some fond memories of making projects about endangered animals and different aspects of climate change, really, such as like preventing rainforests, uh, pres like preserving rainforests or fighting ocean pollution. So these were all topics that were definitely introduced to me um, quite early on within my education. Probably if I had to put it simple, saving animals was where kind of my passion for climate change and yeah, my awareness for our environment started. Um, of course, that was a simplified version, but as a six, seven, eight year old, you it's hard to understand the complexity of climate and everything that's involved. Um, but then as I had more climate change units that I was immersed to over the years, I believe I was definitely able to learn a lot more about detail and complexity, of course, um, which also led to very many opportunities for creativity and innovation through projects and connecting with people, which is where technology comes in. It's a point I'll touch on later, but um, I think it's 
an opportunity for collaboration about complex topics that otherwise would not be possible without technology, um, which now leads me into the fact that I do think I was, my schooling kind of did allow me to get accustomed to technology early on and show me the benefit of being able to collaborate in such a global world. Um, I do consider myself to have quite an international childhood, so that definitely did help me to get immersed into this global atmosphere. But I believe, I mean, in today's day and age, there's really, there's so much negativity and so much news where tech is portrayed as a bad thing and technology is like, oh, we need to limit our use. But I think that there is definitely also positivity. It's a source that fuels ideas in children and young people, of course, in our current world leaders as well. But I think particularly the importance of young people being able to develop their ideas together and exploring new untouched areas um, that will allow us to further develop and find solutions that will help us to solve the problems of tomorrow. Um, and then in throughout my high school journey, really, I believe to give some context, I was always quite a quiet kind of introverted in student. So really building my voice was something that at, at first was quite a step outside of my comfort zone for me. But through different experiences and opportunities, again, with technology and learning more, more about climate and the diversity of climate change and what the environment has to offer, I was able to develop um, more of my own really personal opinions and get the courage, I guess, and the opportunities to share these out as well. Um, and really that would have only been possible with technology because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to connect with people like my team at Take Action Global now. Um, and yeah, so I think it's kind of throughout been a really exciting journey and I look forward to continuing to develop this. I'm currently studying physiotherapy, so interested in going into healthcare after university. Um, and even there, technology has such a big impact and climate change, yeah, it's healthcare. So we might think it's not directly re related, but there are some definitely big effects that can be seen within the field of healthcare as well. So that will definitely be um, interesting topics to continue to pursue. As I hear you share, Carla, I think back to some of the conversations that you and I have had, and I know you're a fierce advocate of ensuring that every voice can be a part of conversations and, and finding ways, seeking out those voices. So making sure it's not just the loudest voices that we hear, but that everyone can have a part of this conversation. Um, and interesting for you and everyone here on this panel, you all came to this, this work and our mission at Take Action Global via technology. So you all took it upon yourselves, sought us out, sent an email or sent a video and said, I want to help. I don't, I don't necessarily know where I fit in, but you took that risk as a young adult. And, and we're just continually so grateful that technology has enabled us to be able to be connected and stay working together. Um, I'd love, as we have some some students from K-12 who are probably listening in and thinking about their preparations for what happens after they graduate. Um, and you've just experienced that. So maybe if you could share a little bit about your transition from your K-12 learning experience into university and how these digital spaces have supported you both in your formal education, what you're seeing right now out in university, and then in your own professional development, which I know you take on often um, as a university student. Yeah, so, I mean, as I am just briefly touched on before, um, my high school definitely already immersed me um, into a variety of different online spaces. And it was very much about the element of collaboration. So we worked in a variety of di digital spaces. And now coming to university in the Netherlands, um, I've been learning and getting to know different platforms and um, there are new opportunities for collaboration and learning and some will work better than others because just simply it's easier to navigate or 
just works in a different way. But I think the important thing is that we also consider them as the positive tool. Again, I'm going to tie back to that point because I think it's so important to reinforce the positivity um, that technology can bring us for the future. Um, and that's definitely something with new opportunities for collaboration here at universities and new opportunities for innovation, really, um, that I've started to learn about and I'm continuing to learn about throughout my journey here. In terms of my kind of professional development outside of academics, it's, I mean, like you mentioned, um, we wouldn't have found each other. And sometimes I have to say it feels like we've met several times in person, but it's kind of, yeah, it's shocking to see the opportunities, but also how comfortable you can get within a team, even if you've never met in person. So I think this really, I mean, those are just some of the examples that really show the benefits of technology um, that can in many aspects definitely overshadow the negativity that is perhaps often portrayed. That's beautifully said. I know I feel like we are we're now a global family and I mean we're we're using all different technologies to communicate throughout the day. So we're we're on Zoom calls, we're in Slack, we're in WhatsApp and we get to all travel and follow each other's journeys uh, as we go. So this idea of using ed tech for social good, I know is um, something that Maria, you came to us with and you had already been using social media, uh, creating different accounts to share out stories, document your journey progress. Um, and you had a specific interest in climate education coming from Peru, then moving to the UK. We were part of that transition with your university program. But as a youth leader, and you're re really leading a lot of these efforts with climate education for the world now, where do you see your role in using technology for good and any advice you have for these young people? Yes, of course. Um, I totally agree. And I'm so inspired by everything that Carla mentioned, because I see so many things resonating with my own story and how I joined TAG. And I've always thought that technology is a great tool for us to understand and connect with different cultures and I think that to be able to see the future through technology but at the same time create a conversation about it and create awareness about what the future might look like through Take Action Global is something that I am really thankful for and as both of you have mentioned we're all here together because of technology and I'm very grateful to have come across TAG at one point in my life where I knew I wanted to create a conversation about climate action and I didn't know that maybe climate education was the best channel and tool for me to start speaking about this and I think that technology as well has been a great channel for me to express myself at TAG and to see how we can continue to expand with Take Action Global and my work at social media and making sure that our community is connected to make sure we reply to the messages from teachers that we post content that they would be interested on, um, such as the Earth Project app that allows them to track their daily activities and how they impact their surroundings and their environment to be able to um, promote webinars that we do, some panels where we connect with people all around the world. It's something that really inspires me a lot. And even meeting people from my country um, in all of these um, communications has been really inspiring. Even negotiating with the Ministry of Education um, from our, my country has has been a great experience for me. And I feel like that also makes me see that at the start of my journey, I felt like I was isolated. Like I knew I wanted to start a conversation about climate education, but I didn't know um, any other person who would join me in the journey. And then Take Action Global came into the picture. I started talking about this um, message and then I ended up meeting people from my country, which is truly inspiring. And it, talks about how the world can be so connected because of technology and because of common passions and common values such as climate education. So I see Take Action Global and technology as tools to create this sense of community, to share ideas, to share values, and to make solutions together um, where we can continue to use technology and create these communities for um, the better good. 
Maria, that was such a cool experience. So uh, Maria is mentioning our conversations with the Ministry of Education of Peru. And so we had been contacted by the Ministry of Education. They were interested in bringing climate education to the country. Um, and we didn't speak the language. And Maria was like, I'll take this on. And so we were having meetings and she's translating. And then all of a sudden, Kun Temers and I, are my co-founder, we're basically just kind of observers in the conversation. And Maria had such a deep understanding of our work at Take Action Global. So I think from then on, basically every conversation was Maria with the ministers of education in Peru. And, and we were just there to support as a help desk, which was really extraordinary. So uh, Maria, you mentioned this, this, this idea of impact. And um, for us, this has been something that we've been giving a lot of attention to in our work. And so both on the climate side and on the education side. So finding it very important for us to document for climate sciences and the work happening globally on that impact in terms of carbon, but then also on the education side in terms of how, how might we teach and learn in a different way? What might innovation look like? We use virtual exchange a lot with our classrooms, and you've been leading a lot of those efforts for the past several years. You've been a part of some virtual exchanges where we're bringing classrooms from different parts of the world together in these digital spaces for a shared experience. Um, maybe if you could share a little bit on what you've observed in some of those virtual exchanges, what has the impact been with young people and um, how do you see us moving forward with that? Yes, definitely being involved in all of these virtual interactions with classrooms around the world has allowed me to reflect a little bit about my experience, but at the same time reflect on the big role that teachers have um, on the development for the eagerness to learn more about climate action in students. I've realized that whenever I meet a new classroom, whether it is our, our mentor sessions, which are part of the climate action project, or our virtual exchanges, which then happen um, as part of the Earth Project and many other initiatives that TAG has, um, I've realized that there is this common connection between all of them, which is that teachers are really, really passionate about climate action. I'm really passionate about students getting to know about it, which really translates in the work that students end up doing. And they are truly passionate about it. They're really interested in getting to know the causes and the source of many climate action um, movements and how they can get involved. So I think it's a very big understanding of what the problem is from them, um, what the problem is in their environment, and how maybe they can change not big things, but smaller things in their daily lives that can end up doing a big change in the long run. And I think that realizing that from a very young age um, has really surprised me and has really made me see how big the impact can be from them. And I I'm so inspired and excited to see what they do in the future because I've heard from them trying to minimize microplastics in the sea to trying to reduce our um, carbon dioxide. I think that these, all of these interactions with classrooms have inspired me more than what I could inspire them. I'm really passionate about climate action, but I think that all these young people are already creating big solutions for our earth and definitely tag is a big um, game changer when it comes to teachers gaining the tools for students to be able to talk about these topics beautifully said maria and um the work you've done as a content creator and a facilitator i know we've had some of our teachers reaching out to us one of our teachers, Carmen, she's uh, leading a homeschool effort. And so she heard about Maria and she was like someone from Peru. And it's just those natural connections, I think, where when you have that association and then there's someone you can bond with and you can grow forward with. And so how might we be able to do that with the students we work with? So I know my I always think back on my daughter. She's 17 now. But when she was four, we did a virtual exchange and she was working with a classroom from Turkey. And then months later, we were walking through the airport and little four-year-old Grace pointed to a map and said, oh, Turkey, I have friends in Turkey. And 
but the people we were with like, oh, no, you don't. We've never been to Turkey. And I was like, she actually does. She has friends that she works with in Turkey. And so moving forward in life and having those associations. And I think that's for us a lot more even what we are committed to is that that human side of the work of climate education. So we have another content creator on our team, Ayanfa, and I'd love to pass that same question over to you as you've been creating a lot of content for our global audience. And also you bring a unique perspective as you have worked with people in both Nigeria and now as a student in Rwanda. So I'd love to hear how are you seeing youth taking action for impact, both within your role as an intern at TAG and then also beyond. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so my experience has been quite diverse. Uh, I can start from uh, right from secondary school, uh, high school, yeah. Actually, way before that. So I first got into contact with um, the whole concept of climate change and environmentalism from watching um, documentary by documentaries by uh, David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough, through um, National Geographic. I think that was my first contact, and then I really got interested in nature, um, got fascinated by um, the food, um, the food chain and everything, the ecosystem. Then um, growing up in Nigeria and studying, uh, having my secondary school there, although I didn't have access to um, ed any education uh, materials about uh, climate change and the environment, we did do some things in biology and, you know, we studied uh, how the how the value chains are connected, how uh, certain ecosystems um, exist and the populations in that exist to make the ecosystem a thing. Then I proceeded, left secondary school, um, and then the whole um, issue about climate change started being uh, a big deal across the world. And then uh, I also ventured in into technology because it's also something that I'm very passionate about. And then I entered TAG using um, also very similar to Carla's story about connecting with Jan through technology. I reached out through um, Herman, who is uh, used to work at TAG as well. And then I started working here as a content creator. Uh, so in terms of impact and how we can all take action to tackle this huge problem of climate change, um, throughout my, uh, my work experience and just interacting with a lot of people, I see a lot of different technologies uh, being developed. Like uh, I have some friends making bricks out of plastics and using them to, you know, build houses and other structures. And that's just one. Uh, I also have a friend who uses uh, actually a help mentor as pro his project using. Uh, he developed a mobile app and a website to help uh, mitigate rape and gender-based violence in Nigeria. And that was actually a huge project. Um, and so I believe technology, although it's gotten a lot of bad rap these days, it still has the potential to, you know, to solve major problems today. For example, you could use blockchain technology, which is mostly known, mostly associated with Bitcoin, which is just a part, a portion of its application. You could use the blockchain today to increase visibility across the supply chain. Doing that would help um, ensure that um, whatever food you're getting, whatever products you're getting is ethically sourced, you know that you're not buying it from a war-torn environment. So there are several huge uh, applications of technology today. You could use deep learning and AI to help uh, improve agricultural um, produce by just targeting, um, measuring and targeting um, nutrient uh, 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 I'm not sure what, what it's called, but you can use it to uh, track uh, uh, how well the soil is has been nourished, uh, if it's getting, whether it's getting the right amount of water, nutrients, or whatever, you can use that as well. So there are new, numerous implications uh, of that. And, and as, a, as an intern at Take Action Global, I've been very privileged to just um, use my creativity, um, garner from different experiences to develop uh, to the best of my abilities, educational videos that we use across um, different classrooms across the world. And I think that's, um, that's one of the big, biggest things that I've done at TAG and I'm really proud, proud of that. 
Yeah. Hey, Yanfa, I'm so happy that you brought up this idea of creativity because I feel like for us to solve some of these global issues, we're going to need as many creative and new ideas from young people as we can. So we're we are working hard to to amplify those voices. Um, and I know you specifically have a, a, an interest in using technology for social good. You came to us. Um, maybe you could share too on what is UX UI and coming with that interest, um, where your future is probably going to take you. But you have so many incredible interests that I think you never know what jobs might look like for someone like you. And you even bring up AI, which in our community of educators is really an important topic right now as we all try to navigate um, how do we bring that in responsibly with our students and support them. But I'd love to invite you to share a little on some of the experiences that you've had as a university student, um, as a citizen in Nigeria and Rwanda, and also a digital citizen of the world. Oh uh, yeah, so I'm not sure where to start because uh, like you said, I have very diverse interests, especially in technology. I, I, I can begin from my uh, work as a UI UX designer. So UI UX is basically user interface and user experience. The UI part is just designing um, the interface, our, web, our website looks like, how a mobile application looks like, while the user experience is how users engage with the website, the product. And so combining both of them, you could um, you know, develop a really great product, uh, digital product, website, or mobile app. And then in the context of uh, environmentalism, you could develop an app that, you know, helps um, challenge the status quo with regards to climate change and make things better. So um, with technology right now, I'm trying to see how you could use uh, blockchain to help um, to, uh, to help increase visibility and uh, optimize information flow across the food value chain because I believe that if um, if we could get this technology right, it's all about establishing the the correct protocol on the blockchain to help you know track the food uh, value chain. I, I think um, doing that is one of the very 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 crucial steps to um, eliminating hunger. I know it's a it's a really lofty goal, but it's actually one of the most crucial technologies that uh, still it's still at its early stages. But going forward, I'm very confident that um, it's going to serve uh, a huge role in reducing hunger and ensuring the fair distribution of food across the world. Um, yeah, what was the other part of the question again, Jen? I think um, on virtual uh, how you are viewing your role as a digital citizen in a global citizen. Okay, um, as a digital citizen, I think uh, the world is growing more connected than ever before. Um, there's the materialization of everything that's um, been developed. Like decades ago, uh, we had huge uh, computers uh, to power uh, our uh, services. In fact, the um, the computer that sent uh, the first man to, to the moon was powered by uh, a microchip that's way less than the power of a mobile phone. So practically, if you had an Android phone, you could you could uh, send a man to the moon in the 60s. So yeah, so there's a lot of development. And as a digital citizen, I think it's just recognizing that uh, as technology continues to advance every day, there's always um, th this chasm of the, the human um, the human element of you know technology and society because um, when you bring in the topic of AI, uh, it raises a lot of um, questions, questions and ethics. Uh, for example, um, in, uh, I, I, I read about a research um, on an AI technology that was supposed to uh, distinguish faces and from uh, different faces from different races. And it turns out the 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 technology, the, the AI system. Uh, turned out to be racist and everything. So means that there's a lot of crucial um, human elements that's been um, uh, avoided or perhaps not considered. So I believe that as digital citizens, we all have the rights to 
uh, uh, use our voices, like Carla had mentioned and Maria, use our voices to the best of our abilities to, to ensure that uh, the human element of um, society is very well integrated with technology. And um, also that uh, um, privacy is also a very important concern today with you know, um, big technologies can practically track wherever going god mode it's pretty easy nowadays so i think um, when it comes to policy and um, development and policy development and frameworks i think we should always advocate for uh, the protection of uh, human rights through technology because uh, it just opens a whole new landscape a whole new uh, boundary where um, the current standards the current laws do not really apply in digital spaces so i think we need to start thinking about how individually we we set the, the right rules to govern this spaces this newly developing spaces so that our society is you know progressing on the right path yeah hey Anfa, um hopefully you'll have a chance to read some of the comments we have educators from around the world interested in learning more from you um perhaps having you connect with their students which I think would be tremendous. You bring up a lot of important topics that we're facing right now in terms of technology and with educational technology. I know I can speak, I mean, you all are representing voices of, the, our, of our youth. I can share that I talk to a lot of teachers who are overwhelmed with these topics. And when we talk about um, blockchain and AI, and I know for me personally, my background is not in computer science, but is in literacy. But my message to teachers often is that you don't have to feel like an expert in these new technologies, but it's opening up the conversation with students and, and helping them to be critical consumers, helping them to explore with, with creativity and with inquiry, um, seeking out different perspectives. Quickly, before we, we jump over to our next panelist, is there anything um, else, Ayanfa, that you may want to share some words of advice with teachers who are listening on how they can best approach some of these new technologies and teaching and learning in the classroom that would maybe benefit some of our K-12 students. Uh, having interacted with a couple of teachers back in Nigeria, I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but I think a crucial uh, characteristic that comes up is the concern over uh, technology and education. There's like there's a, there's numerous implications. There's new, numerous applications of technology to you know help boost um, learnings, learning outcome for students. I think um, teachers around the world should be, um, while they're they're cautious, cautious, understandably, I think they should be um, open to adopting um, technology in improving um, learning outcomes. For example, uh, growing up and in, in a in a very different um, in sub-Saharan Africa where access to certain technologies um, was very limited. Uh, I, I was able to, I was privileged enough to access a lot of um, several information of the world through just watching some of these documentaries by going to the libraries, by accessing the internet. I, I, I would say I, I was kind of uh, a bit far ahead of the class to a certain degree by just, you know, having this uh, this exposure i think that's critical because the the rate of technology is of technology development today is accelerating even beyond um, moore's law of microchips being uh, two times better every uh, 18 months so i think that uh we should also try to uh, try uh, as much as we we're, we're, we're wary of the uh the potential negatives of technology we should be uh open enough to, to embrace the really positive aspects of what it offers, especially in education. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, and I hope that we can continue um, some of those topics and different conversations that you shared today. We have people sharing here from YouTube, uh, Elizabeth talking about the importance of listening. And I think us as teachers really being able to step back and listen to our students who do have some experience with some of these topics and helping them explore and have access to resources like you mentioned David Attenborough really inspiring you when you were young so thank you for your your incredible words today and your inspiration every day so someone that I've been working with 
for several years now came to us as a high school student. So using technology to share out her voice and advocate for her interest, Rhea joining from Canada, we had first met and worked on a project where we were in a conversation like this, where we were interviewing Undersecretary General at the United Nations, Melissa Fleming. And I just, I think back and, and it feels like that was so long ago, but also just yesterday, but now you're joining us as a university student and you are deeper into your studies, helping lead a program that we're now working on with the United States Department of State all around virtual exchange. We have 40 educators from 40 countries and um, all these different embassies. So Ria, I'd love to hear from you just on how virtual exchange has kind of evolved over the past few years since you've started using it and how global collaboration has been a part of your specific experience. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, yeah, I, like Jen said, I reached out to her um, a couple of years ago wanting to collaborate and work with her. And here I am now. I'm going to share a little bit about my education journey as well and kind of how that has to do with a lot of the exchange programs and virtual exchanges that we're seeing nowadays. So I always say to people that 70% of my education journey has really been out in the field and working with different educators, professors, doctors, researchers on co-creating solutions that have to do with climate change, global health, political instability, um, women and girls in STEM, et cetera, et cetera. So I started out when I was 16 years old in high school. Um, I knew that there was a co-op program in my high school that I really wanted to be a part of. I just didn't know exactly where to go or you know, really how to facilitate that. And I think that was my first kind of initiation. Um, it was a first initiative that I took really kind of spearheading um, and really doing things on my own and figuring things out for myself. So I reached out to my school guidance counselor and I said, I want to do a co-op program at one of the most competitive research hospitals in Canada. It's called the Hospital for Sick Children, um, a very well-known pediatric institute all over the world. And I, I got a lot of um, teachers and advice saying that it would be very, very hard and the program is very, very selective, uh, which it was. But I ended up completing the process, going through references, um, multiple different character interviews, um, you know, going through the resume process, that whole thing for about a month. And I was finally able to get admitted into the program as, as a co-op student. And that was kind of, I still remember that day when I got the acceptance email. It was one of the best days of my life. And that experience for me working in a hospital, working alongside um, researchers, doctors, and very, very young kids who were suffering from diseases and illness, it both really saddened me to see that the state of our world is like this, where people have to suffer unfairly and unjustly, but it also fueled this passion in me to want to change that and see that as almost a strength to want to do better and, you know, kind of see the situation as almost a mechanism and this underlying force to want to make improvements in our world. So I started working with different researchers at the Artificial Intelligence and Genomic Institute. Um, the funny thing is I actually wanted to be a doctor when I was 16. Now I'm majoring in political science, but, um, I started working with researchers and doctors and uh, professors that were collaborating with the Hospital for Sick Children. And I started shadowing them on rotations, working in their labs, just learning more about these topics that have to do with global health, uh, global health programs that they had in developing, in developing countries such as Kenya and Nigeria um, and cities all over the world where the health system really wasn't as great. And 
I think that was something that for me was an incredible learning experience, just observing and sometimes knowing that I might not be the expert in the situation, but it's okay to kind of take a step back and actually process what is going on in front of me. So that lasted for about a year and then COVID hit. Um, I'm sure the pandemic has changed many of our lives and it really changed the way that I view internships, virtual exchanges, uh, doing co-op programs in both university and high school. And I'm sure that it's also changed the way that many people work all over the world. And I think for me, something that I learned that was so powerful is that you don't need to always be in person working with somebody to feel that strong connection to them. I wanted to experience something that was greater than just being a co-op student. I wanted to be a part of something that was bigger. So I decided that I would apply to be part of um, different advisory councils at the United Nations and see what that role would be like, really advising um, different processes, advising different programs to take in the youth voice. So I started doing that. And that was a collaborative effort with people from really every corner of the world, from Canada to Alaska to uh, foreign regions um, in India. It was incredible because I got to see what it was like to work with people virtually that you know, couldn't meet in person, but they had this strong connection and this strong faith of wanting to do better and wanting to um, improve the world. And, you know, add that on to the fact that they were all youth, they were all young people like me. Um, I think I was just ending high school at the time I was finishing up my last year. So again, that was a very momentous um, experience for me. And from there, I started working on these councils. I view working internationally and globally with people. Uh, for example, even if it's on Zoom calls or if it's on, you know, talking in panels and lives like this or doing conferences virtually, it's a way of connecting with an audience and kind of figuring out what you guys can do collectively to make the world a better place and leave the world a little bit better than how you entered into it. So, um, I think that was something that was really important for me to recognize and realize. And as I started working on these advisory councils, I really found my passion in political science and the intersections between climate change and global health. That was also something that I was studying at Sick Kids. How does air pollution and different types of pollution impact people and patients in developing countries, specifically young kids? So it really fueled my passion to look at the bigger picture and the underlying mechanisms of the political institutions that were either not funding healthcare programs properly or taking a look at what can we do better to help these political systems and help these leaders and advise these um, people in positions of power to do better for their citizens. Um, so that was an incredible way for me to do these advisory, advisory positions to tap into working with people of authority. And it also helped me to, you know, sometimes I would be the only woman um, that was in a Zoom call. Sometimes I would be the youngest person there most of the time. Uh, sometimes I would be the only person of color there, sometimes all three. So it was hard for me at times to connect with people um, of different genders, you know, races, et cetera, especially since they all came from a perspective of working in the industry for 20 plus years. And I was just a, you know, university student at the time wanting to learn more, but it gave me a chance to, again, observe. And then also when I was ready and confident, use my voice to offer a different perspective, especially with the state of our world and how much learning has changed for both university and high school students. So um, I think my most recent experience with virtual exchanges really has been working with Jennifer, like she mentioned, on the Department of State program. And once again, I feel like I'm a student. I'm learning so much about what it's like to work with educators from all over the world and feel so connected to them and feel so inspired by their journeys and have them be inspired by my journey as a student and kind of work together to figure out how can we make them more experienced in climate education for their students and for the next generation. And I think that's something that 
has been incredibly promising for me. So I'm really very excited to see what the next phase of that project brings. And, um, you know, I think there's so many, the world is so multifaceted that we have to be extremely diverse when it comes to using technology. And technology really can be used as a tool for social change when it comes to working on these different projects and interacting with people from all over the world. Thank you, Ria. And as I listen to you, I think about when I was a little girl and we would read storybooks or we would have conversations with teachers. And even like from my first memories, it was, what are you going to be when you grow up? Are you going to be a firefighter or a doctor or an attorney or a teacher? And you kind of lock into that path. And I wanted to be a teacher. And I also wanted to be an astronaut and I wanted to be a doctor. Um, but I've been able to as I started as a teacher, really start to explore a lot of different career opportunities, like thinking about marketing or thinking about data science. Um, but from each of you, I hear that kind of theme bubbling up and just my emotion and the word that comes to mind is just how curious you all are. And you just want to learn so much and the world has so many opportunities. So I can't even imagine which direction you all will go in, but I know it will be doing such good things for our world. And um, so thank you for the, those words of inspiration. And, and I want to jump over to Yiting to make sure we can hear from your voice. And I'd love to end today for our audience to think about the future. And as you have your perspective and the work that you're doing, if you had the power to see into the future, what would you hope uh, 2050 future would look like? And also, what digital citizenship skills that students are learning today do you think, Yiting, from your view in Beijing, will be essential for years to come? And thank you for questioning. And if I have a chance to see the future, I hope the environment will be much better at that time through our efforts and there will be more people aware of the importance of climate action. Uh, since we have done much work in environmental protection, the achieve, achieve, uh, achievement will accumulate, accumulate gradually and finally become prominent in 2050. Also, the progress we made will attract more and more people to take part in it. Although there must be more climate issues waiting for us, I still hold faith that we can finally overcome them. Um, and for digital citizenship skills, I think digital communication, digital health and welfare, and also digital security and privacy are essential in years to come. Digital communication is understanding the different mo modes and mediums of digital technology and when to appropriately use them. For example, an understanding when sending an email is appropriate versus sending a text message. Digital health and welfare is maintaining sound technological practices to promote psych uh, physical and psychological awareness. Practicing eye safety and ergonomics and Balancing screen time and technology usage all are all related to this important principle. And, and for digital security and privacy are electronic precautions to bolster online safety. Secure passwords, not sharing pass passwords, backing up data and protections all are all are all examples of this principle. These skills above uh, will help us to become a good digital citizen. Thank you, Yiting, for those beautiful words. And as everyone listening in, a lot of our speakers here today, English isn't their first language. And I'm always blown away at how articulate and poised you all are. We're hearing some of those comments in the chat box. So. So thank you for translating for us non-native speakers. 
Um, eating brings up some digital citizenship skills that teachers can work on today with students. Things as simple as having secure passwords and thinking about your own identity as a digital citizen. As we finish up, I'd love to turn it back over to our panel for one piece of advice you all have for our students and keeping them central to this conversation. So maybe we have students who are joining from first grade classrooms or all the way up through university like you all, but maybe we could go around and any advice you have for our young people that you can share based on your journey as a student and now a global change maker. And maybe Eating, we'll start with you. Um, yes, and uh... we'll come back to eating and Ria, we'd love to hear your advice. Yeah, for sure. I think um, something I talked about in my own education journey with really reaching out to several different programs, whether it's participating in something virtually, participating in virtual exchanges, um, or even in person now, thankfully things have opened up when it comes to co-op programs and internships. Something that I always tell students is be proactively involved. Make sure that 50% of whatever you're learning in school is actually being applied in the real world and ensure that you are participating in internships, even if it's something that lasts you know, one to two months. It could be an incredible learning experience for you, and it could make you even more motivated in the classroom to learn something that you know you will be able to apply elsewhere and in different workplaces and use it to be able to network and connect with uh, people your own age or people that can open doors for you. Um, in multiple different industries. So I guess my biggest advice would be, you know, seek internships, proactively seek opportunities that allow you to participate and engage with others and ensure that much of your educational learning comes from your environment and your experiences outside the classroom. Thank you, Ria. And back over to Yiting. And thank you, sorry, my, there's something wrong with my network and um, for these questions, although I have only been joined this organization for less than two months, I've learned a lot from this precious experience. The most meaningful takeaway for me is that I found there are so many youths all around the world taking part in climate actions, and there is actually no barrier to it. Uh, maybe many other people think like me in the past that young people do not have the power of protecting the environment as they are busy studying or working. And it's better to take climate action if they have enough time or experience. But after joining Take Action Global, I know I was wrong. There is no such thing called right time for climate action but everyone is welcome to join it. Our youth have more creative and energy than any other age group, so the work of climate action won't be successful without us. You may think joining an online meeting like today or sharing your environmental-friendly ideas with your family are really small things, but these things will accumulate and can eventually make a big difference. It's not only true in the environment area, but also in many others. So um, I, I suggest that uh, you don't hesitate and show vitality of use. Oh, what a perfect call to action eating. The time is now for everyone to get involved. So that's beautifully said. Thank you so much. All right, Ayanfa, over to you for final words from your advice. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say first as a young person and as an African um, young person, uh, I'd say that, yeah, there might be, although there might be certain challenges you'd be facing along the way, I mean, given given your, um, the socioeconomic obstacles, 
regardless, I think productivity, like Ria said, is a very important skill because just getting yourself, uh, putting yourself out there and I can get you in the room that you're looking for. I think that's something that's um, helped me so far. Um, I think also just participating in certain things and certain activities, certain um, conferences um, that uh, might you might find perhaps on the internet or through your different schools. I think those um, different initiatives would definitely help you um, get to where you, where you want to be in terms of um, uh, your, your career um, aspirations or even educational goals. So I think that um, just putting yourself out there is a very critical skill. Also, uh, it helps to, um, to always understand that you're no longer just a citizen of your country. You're now a global citizen. You're now more connected than um, different generations before us. And so um, that having that in mind would even help you more in terms of your communication across different cultures, because I think cross-cultural communication is a critical skill today. So, yeah. Thank you, Ayanta. I know for me, I feel like opportunity is everywhere. Just having eyes open for it and being ready to take action, which I know you all exemplified. Thank you for those words. Uh, over to you, Maria, and you've had a lot of experience in this. I'd love to hear what you would recommend for young people listening in today on ways that they can get going on taking action. Yes, definitely. I would say um, be eager to learn, learn as much as you can and find your passions in the process. Um, I would say also think about the message that you want to spread and the message that you want to create a community around um, and maybe use the tools that you have um, in your environment to do this. And if those tools don't, don't exist, then create them. And I think that's very related to what Ria and Ayanfa have been mentioning, um, to be productive. Um, which is very valuable nowadays to create opportunities for yourself and for others as well um, in order to spread all of these and allow people to develop around you, around the ideas that you are inspired about. Mm -hmm. I think great advice for both, for anyone really, but students and teachers, but be very clear on your purpose, be very clear on your message. Important today is there's so much noise that we are bombarded with but um, center, centering on that is a great first step. Thank you for being here, Maria. And then Carla, just as we started, we'll come back to you for our, our final and closing words. We'd love to hear your advice for young people today. Yeah, so I think I'd um, strongly build off of what Maria said. I really, I'd say go explore, go explore new areas, the untouched, the topics you don't know much about, really what makes your heart smile, I think I'd put it that way. Um, and I think the important thing is don't be scared to explore. Even if people tell you it's not possible, it doesn't mean that it's not possible. It might just be a new possibility that hasn't been explored yet, which is where technology can ultimately be used as a tool and not as only as a danger. And I think it's really important we realize that and can utilize it to our benefit. Um, to also see the value it has for global collaboration, because ultimately, I strongly believe the world is full of positivity, but sometimes it does just really take an extra step to maybe find the next ray of sunshine. Leaves me speechless, Carla. Well, I, I feel absolutely honored to have shared the stage with each of you. You all are my purpose and my why, and every opportunity I have to hear from you, I just continue to learn and to be inspired. And I know our planet is in good hands with this generation and with young change makers like you leading the way. So I know all of you are in the midst of your university program and many projects. So thank you for taking time to be here today. And thank you to Mary Alice and her team for the opportunity. We'd love to continue the conversation. I know I saw in the chat box, a lot of our teachers who are joining want to continue the conversation with each of you. So please follow us on Climate Action EDU hashtag and we have resources, we have programs, we'll have the Climate Action Project 
coming up in the fall. All of the team here is part of coordinating that effort and other programs that we'd love to share with you. So thank you and congratulations for a great month of digital citizenship. We hope you all have a fantastic Earth Day next week. You're muted. Okay, we just wanted, yeah. you were behind the screens, but honestly, the comments, I know that there were high schoolers um, joining in from California. I know there were high schoolers joining in from New York. I know there were first graders joining in from Florida. We had Nigeria, I know, was joining in. I don't know what age students were joining in, but like, it was really, really exciting. I mean, and powerful. Um, so much hope because of each of you, because of your words and your actions, and you model that all it takes is one person to want to stand up and speak out. And then that one person becomes many. And Juania, my colleague in Mexico, I know that she was in there. How can we continue to bring this to Latin America? Um, the fact that you all introduced yourselves in your native language, Here's my, with that sign language, I don't know if you can see me with my background. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's I love you, that's I really love you. This no. was so powerful and we are so proud that we got to celebrate you. Well, thank you for having us back this year. Count us in for events in the future and we're always by your side, Mary Alice. Oh, wonderful. And I know the last thing we were gonna mention was that call to action and that what we've done this month, all month long, is to celebrate um, students and classrooms and school communities. But we really are doing that also to honor a colleague um, and a friend, Steve Sostak. And just before we end, Jen, if there's anything that you wanted to add about Inspire Citizens and that ripple effect, it would be wonderful. Oh, thank you for, for bringing focus to Steve and his, his great work and, and his life. Um, I had the honor of working with him early on as I was coming into Twitter spaces and getting connected. My co-founder, Kutemers, traveled with him to Asia and presented. And though my colleagues here today did not have the chance to work with him, his message and his commitment to global collaboration and human experience and shared stories goes on with them. Oh, that's just beautiful. And um, I'm just glad that this entire month we get to celebrate. We don't want to just talk about it. We want to put it into action. And that's something that Steve did every single day of his life. So here's to all those ripples, continuing these positive ripples. So thank you so much for joining us live. We will always celebrate you. Um, and I know that just from the comments, I think you're gonna be getting um, contacted by classrooms to, <laughs> to join them as well. That's fantastic. All right. Take care everyone. Thank you for having thank us. You.